Welcome to this Saturday special of Paint a Beautiful Picture. My name is Violet Newby, the host of Paint a Beautiful Picture. Today I have two awesome guests with me who also happen to be my friends. <laughs> one of them is Alicia Metz and the other one is Alyssa Haney. And we are really happy to have you with us today. Ladies, well, good to have you here. Good to be here. Awesome. We're going to party. <laughs> we usually do. All right. So I've heard you talking a little bit about um, an inner life. Uh, I think you said it was something like that. Can you explain to me, I guess, I, I don't know if Alyssa knows about it, but can you explain to me at least, um, what is an inner life? Okay. You know, a couple of weeks ago, you and I talked about what it's like mm -hmm. when we're talking to ourselves. That's an aspect of our inner life. Okay. When you're all by yourself and it's quiet and you're meditating, you're thinking, you're contemplating what's going on in there, in your inner world. If the only thing that's going on in there is you're going back and forth around conversations you've had in the past and how that person talked to you and the way that person treated you and how they act toward you. And then what you're going to say the next time this happens, you know, and you're, you're chewing over all this stuff and you're like, there's nothing rich or good or full or beautiful in there. In order for that to happen, you have to put that in there. And so it has to do with what you listen to in terms of music and what you look at in terms of art or certain kinds of creative endeavors and kind, the kind of books or the kind of literature and the kind of movies that you see. Uh, it has to do with what you contemplate about. So whether you contemplate scripture or you contemplate a foreign language or you contemplate your great dreams. Someday I'm going to be on the stage and I'm going to be famous. Someday I'm going to go to you know, the Philippines and work with little kids who are poor. I'm going to go to India like Mother Teresa and I'm going to love little kids and feed them and hold them and protect them. I'm going to do everything I have to do in order to get there. So you develop this inner life. A lot of times, most of the people in the world, sadly, they have this huge external life and they don't take any time for a rich inner life. So when you have one, when you develop one, when you really start to engage with beauty and things that are significant, then you really, I'm not kidding you, your life becomes so much fuller and so much more meaningful. Because if you don't have a rich inner life, you have some kind of an inner life. And a lot of times it's much more chaotic and frankly, a lot more negative because you haven't been very purposeful in developing this inner life. Hmm. That's what your inner life is. Hmm. As a kid, of course, nobody ever taught me about this or showed me about this or demonstrated this to me. And then there was all this chaos and all this arguing and whoa, yeah, like it was a big leap for me to find out what a rich inner life was. In third grade, before I went to third grade, I lived right down the street from my school. So I'm sitting on the steps of my elementary school and this really classy looking lady walks up to me and she said, what's your name? So I'm this curly haired, you know, redheaded little freckle faced wild kid. And I said, Violet. And she said, oh, what grade are you in? I said, I'm going to be in third grade. I'm in Mrs. Scott's class. She said, oh, I'm Miss Colbeth. I'm teaching fifth grade. And I said, oh, my goodness. I bet you're going to have to teach my brother. She said, what's your brother's name? And I told her. She said, yes, he's in my class. I said, man, you're going to need some help. <laughs> I, you know, I know my brother. This was my best friend. I was well aware of what a wild man he was. Seems very unlikely, probably, that, you know, I was all of eight years old and she was nearly 40, that she and I would be friends for well over 40 years. Hmm. And we were. And she actually loved literature and she really loved art and she loved opera. I mean, she dressed impeccably. She was really a classy person. Uh, I started playing French horn in third grade. Most kids got to play in fifth, but because I could already read music and loved everything about it. And Mr. Detter, our band teacher, found out that I could and I could play all this music on the recorder. So he one time he said to me, he said, what do you know about the French horn? I said, nothing. And he went out in his car and he got one and he brought it and he put it into my hands. 
I started playing it. Just like, oh my word, you know, I was born to play the French horn. Well, because of that, one day, Ruth actually brought, well, of course, she was Miss Colbeth back then, but anyway, she actually brought a turntable and a whole selection of records and sat me down in her classroom after school and said, I want you to hear something. She put on a Mozart concerto with Dennis Brain playing the French horn and dead serious for 30 minutes I just sat there enthralled and never said a word. Later, when we were really good friends and I was an adult, Ruth said, I said, holy, this was m like miraculous. I found something that can shut this kid up. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> oh, my word, you know. It was astounding. Like, I can still tell you, I actually own that album of hers. And I actually own that record player. But I have that thing on almost every computer, you know, iPhone, uh, playback system. Everything I have has that Dennis Brain set of Mozart concerti on it. Land sakes. I learned what the beauty of music was. It was very fascinating for me. As an adult, there were various times in my life when I had nothing around me. Like in the Philippines, when I would work at the dumps, there was just nothing there. A lot of overwhelming ugliness. Little kids starving to death, dying of TB, living in the trash heaps. It was awful. And even at moments like that sometimes, just like the beauty of this music would swell up in me. And I would realize that everything in the world wasn't all about death and ugliness. <laughs> So I'm telling you, you know, developing a rich inner life really has amazing benefits. The other thing is she was the first person who ever took me to the opera. And so we went and saw Figaro at the Detroit Opera Company. Oh, my stars alive. I mean, the costuming and the beauty of the Ford Theater downtown. Just man alive. I really learned a lot from Ruth about the beauty of an inner life. And when I became an adult, I found people that had that. Maybe they grew up with it. Their parents exposed it to them. Um, they had so much more of it than I had. And I would talk to them about what they did and how they thought. And I would, you know, adopt some of what they told me or go with them. I learned more and more about it. So really, it kind of had the seeds in childhood in my friendship with Miss Colbeth but I don't think it came to full fruition until I was an adult. That's why I think when a child has the opportunity to have that and their parents start to do that and enrich their life, they're far ahead. They understand it and they have it with them all the time. Cool. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think about that? Do you think, like, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Oh, See, they don't know what I'm asking them. It's all a surprise, so here we are, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Do you have elements in your life that you think get, contribute to a rich inner life? Or are you going, whoa, dude, I got to catch up? Or, you know, what? I definitely think um, I have aspects. Like, I haven't been working on it for very long, a couple of years. But there's definitely things like, you know, the quiet time that I take or reading or just... Um, I really learned to appreciate nature, kind of like you. I've heard you talk about a lot. Just, you know, when the sun's out or, you know when you see this pretty tree and the leaves and whatever, like I've learned to appreciate nature and like just not even sit in it and just look and just be and just, I don't know. Like I do, I've learned to appreciate nature a lot more and just a long time and learning how to be with myself mm -hmm. and be comfortable with myself and, and love myself, frankly. <laughs> but yeah. I still have a lot more to go, and you're inspiring me to do that. So, Yay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think this is actually something that we talked about when I was in like high school, and I might be butchering this, but I'm pretty sure I once heard the quote, um, "You are what you think about," and that kind of sounds like what you're describing with the whole inner life thing. Um, I don't know. I think that's interesting. It's an interesting concept, and it's definitely something that's very like prevalent in our lives that we don't, but we don't even think about it. Like, I'm not mindful to my inner life thing like it's not something I think about like how can it make my inner life like uh, more beneficial to me or whatever that's not something I think about regularly but even so it's still something I practice you know okay like without thinking about it it's just like I just 
I think it's kind of like what we were talking about earlier um, when we were talking about um, like speaking to yourself kindly. Like I feel like if I'm if I'm understanding you correctly, like that's one way of building up your inner life. Um, it's kind of like creating an oasis in your mind, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And I, I really like both of you guys' comments. So I'm going to stick them together. Mm -hmm. When we go out into nature and we hear things we don't usually hear, like we're not hearing traffic, mm -hmm. we're not hearing kids yell and scream and cry and all the things that kids do out in the neighborhood, and we're not hearing people badger us or tell us all the things we need to do, or, you know, we just, we can quiet down all of that stuff. And it's amazing how much sound there is out in nature. Like, I love to hear the trees in the fields clap their hands. When you're in a forest, they when there is a good breeze, they clap their hands in praise to God together. I love that part. But also when you, like, lay in the grass out in a meadow in the middle of woods, one of my favorite things to do, you hear so many things. You'll hear the squirrels chitter, and you'll hear chipmunks make funny noise and run through the grass, and you'll, you'll literally hear the grass blow, like the sound of the grass brushing together. You know, and the smells. Oh, my gracious. It's so fragrant out in the woods. Like, I, there's a huge difference between the smell of a moss and a fungus, which most people will be like, okay, that sounds kind of boring to me. Well, it depends on who you are, I guess. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like the fragrance of wildflowers out in the woods. I absolutely love all of those things. And so then when your mind can get quiet and all of that external noise gets quiet, that's when who you really are and the way that you talk to yourself and how you think about yourself comes out. So the more that you've put in there that's beautiful and full, mm -hmm. the more you enjoy that time. Yeah, and I've definitely mm -hmm. realized that if you do that, like you go by yourself and you go sit down somewhere and you can't handle it, you've got issues that you need to deal with. It's probably a good target to go, oh, there might be something I have to handle here. Yeah. 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 Clue. Okay, I saw that. Yeah, because, I mean, if you can't handle your own silence or, like, if there's nothing to say when it's just you, uh, like, you're just empty. You just really are, and it, it kind of shows that, that you're not comfortable with yourself or you're, it shows that you're completely relying on other people all the time to keep you occupied or keep you uh, busy or make you feel like you have purpose. Mm -hmm. So it really shows that a lot of the really important things in us are empty if we can't be comfortable with our being by ourselves. It's kind of like it's good. It's kind of like how some people like when they're in the car they can't not listen to music. Like they always have to be playing music in the car and can't just sit alone with their thoughts. Like I personally cannot do that. Like most of the time I don't have anything playing just because I really enjoy the quiet time, but. I do know there's plenty of people out there that, like, they cannot stand to have that 10 minutes alone in their car. Yes. Um, and just, like, because it, if you have that 10 minutes alone in your car, let's say your radio's broken. Like, actually, this is what happened to me. My radio broke. It's the reason I got used to being quiet in the car. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, there was headphones and stuff, but I didn't feel safe driving with earbuds in for a while there. Um, so I had to get used to driving in the car without any music um, when I was, like, 18. And I, I found, like, it's actually, it turned out to be a huge blessing. I'm like, it's great. Like, I love, I love the you had silence. to get okay with it. I did have to get okay with it. Yeah, I did. I think yeah, it did take some it's... adjusting. But, but I also, like, even without, like, the silence in the car, like, there was, there would be times outside of being in my car where I would still have my uh, inner life. Um, but, like, that definitely took it to another level. Mm -hmm. Um because, like, that's just, like, an extra 15 minutes to wherever you're going and back, like, every day that you now are spending in silence. Where before, it's like you're spending that time just, uh, like, listening to music or whatever, and it's not really being super beneficial to you. But when my radio broke, I found myself spending a lot more time, um, like, praying or, like, just making up, like, songs or something in my head. Like, just... A bunch of different stuff and it's a lot more comes out of it when or a lot co more comes out of me whenever I am sitting in that silence rather than distracting myself and that's not to say that you can't distract yourself sometimes of course it's always nice sometimes exactly but I think it's great to be able to just 
be able to sit in your own silence. Yeah, I think those are really great comments. Mm -hmm. So, Violet, um, how do you go about not making some mistakes that your parents made in raising you? Like, how do you consciously move from doing something that would be very natural for you to do in raising your kids because your parents did that with you growing up? How do you turn from that natural instinct to making a turn to do something different and to do better? Okay. Every single one of us is very prone to do what we saw our parents do. What do you know? And so a lot of times you'll hear people go, I'm not going to do that. Five years later, they say, oh, my word, I opened my mouth. And there was my mother's voice coming straight out of my voice. Yeah. Okay. We all do that. We really do. It's human nature. We repeat what we've seen. And we see it for two decades growing up. Oh, my goodness. That's probably what we're going to do. And yet we say, man, I don't think that was good. I see this and this and this as a result of that. That's not how I want to do it. What in the world am I going to do about this? Okay, so let me tell you. We're talking about going a particular way and having a real strong bent to go that way. In fact, let me tell you something scientific about your head. Inside of your brain, when something happens once, there's like a little teeny line that goes across the gray matter. You do something repeatedly, you know, 20, 30, 40 times, it starts making a little groove. You do something hundreds and thousands of times, I mean, it's making a valley through that gray matter. It's there. That pathway, your brain's got a hold of it. Suddenly you want to switch it. I mean, you want to make a new path. You want to do something different. Whoa, that is really tough stuff. I'm not kidding you. This requires work. When people go, oh, I'm going to do this differently. I'll tell them, I believe you. I know you intend to. I understand that you're motivated to. But man, you better get your hands on some determination and courage because it's going to take both of those to do it differently. I'm just telling it to you straight. It's not going to happen easily. But when you look at it, you actually kind of need to break it down if you can. Okay. So let me, I'm going to tell you a really specific one. I know a family and they watch TV together every night. That's just what they do. You know, they get done with dinner and they sit down in front of the tube and whatever's on there, they're watching it. I'm talking two or three hours a night, every single night. That's what they do. They just like watch TV. Their one kid who's a teenager said, I'm not doing that when I grow up. Like there's a whole lot more interesting stuff in the world to do than sit in front of the television set. No joke, right? We all know that. That's going to be tough though, because that's all they know. And so when they grow up, like probably talking 1920-ish, because even in college, that's what they'll, that's what they've already done. That's what they'll be prone to do. You know, get off of classes and whatever and sit in front of the television. That's what they've done their whole life. Why wouldn't they do that? They are going to have to really determine, I'm not doing this. I'm going to go out with my friends. I'm going to, and I do mean this appropriately. I'm not talking going getting drunk or going getting high. You know, I'm going to go party, hang out, have fun, goof around, uh, play music, play my guitar because the kid happens to play the guitar. You know, I'm going to go do something different, but it takes determination to do it. But Once he has a family, it's really going to take some strong determination to say, when we get done with dinner, we're going to go take a walk as a family. I'm going to buy everybody in my family a bicycle. We're going to go out and ride bikes together. Uh, I'm going to put up a basketball hoop in my yard, and I'm going to go shoot hoops, even if I shoot them with my wife. I'm going to do something different. And then notice every single thing that I said had an action involved. You have to have a plan of action. Then you have to have the courage to follow through because it's so easy just to go along with the pattern. It takes real strength and determination and courage to change the pattern. And it takes an action plan usually to make it change. So I'm going to go into the emotional realm for a minute. You have a family and I'm going to use a really simple one that's kind of not mean or anything. Okay. But you're, you're so used to this. In your family, someone's down the hall and someone else is yelling at him, I said get in here, it's time for dinner. You know, they, they don't go get them. 
you know how I had that rule when I was growing up. There was no yelling at, in my kid's life. There was no yelling. I would go down the hall. I would say, it's time for dinner. If they needed something, they had to come where I was and speak to me. I grew up with enough yelling. I never wanted to hear it again, right? Well, that didn't just happen. <laughs> Trust me, when my kids were little, I would yell for them. When I determined that wasn't going to be happening at my house anymore, I already had to break my own habit of doing that and theirs and stand up and go walk down the hall and speak to them. But land sakes, in three to six months when I didn't have to listen to all this yelling anymore, <laughs> it was amazing. I was so happy. So yeah, you have to look at something and make that assessment with strong determination, say, I'm not going to do this and have the courage to develop a plan that's going to take you another way. Right, right. Does that help? It does, it does. But, um, you know, whenever you're talking about like specific scenarios, I guess you'd have to speak to that a little bit more, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah. You don't have to give yeah. me a specific example about your family yeah. on camera. Just every single one of us, if we grew up in a really healthy, happy, great home, still, there might be things we want to tweak. It's like, if that was really good, but I didn't like this so much, and I don't think that's how I'm going to do it. Okay. That's really okay. And mm -hmm. that's how you go about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, um, it kind of, it makes me think about like what I do with my dog. So, like, I have this little puppy. He's, like, a year old now. A um, little over a year old. And I love my dog, but he's very annoying. <laughs> and I'm not exactly a dog person. I, I'm i definitely more of a cat person. But, um, yeah, he's, I mean, he's a puppy, so he definitely gets into things. He destroys things. He destroyed my baby blanket. He destroyed my bouquet from my sister's wedding that I was in. So, yeah, me and this dog have had our tussles. But um, I've decided, like, I, I don't want to raise my kids the way that I was raised. And so sometimes I've discovered, like, it's very natural to, for me to want to yell at my dog or just, like, react a lot instead of just calming down and handling it in um, just a healthier way. Like, I mean, with dogs, like, they don't know that they're doing something wrong. They're just playing. And so you really do have to handle things calmer. Um but that's not natural to me. Like, when when he does something, like, destroys something that's super important to me, like, I just want to react and, like, uh, just, like, basically, like, get revenge in a way um, and, like, discipline him. But I have had to actively decide that I'm not going to treat my dog the way that my emotions are telling me to and that I'm going to treat him with kindness because he doesn't know what he's doing wrong and I'm still going to train him that it's not okay to do that but I just can't do it the way that I was raised through being emotional and yelling because he's not going to understand that. Um, and I've been mindful of the thought that, like, I mean, you know, they I've heard many times, like, how you treat your pets is how you treat your kids. And I'm like, I know I don't want to treat my kids uh, <laughs> the way I can treat my dog sometimes. So he definitely gives me a lot of opportunity to practice that. <laughs> That's a really good point. I don't fully agree with how you treat your do your yeah. dog is how you're going to treat your kids. But there's an element of truth in that. Yeah. In that, especially when you have a baby or even a two-year-old, they don't really understand the implications of everything they're doing. Mm -hmm. They're going to do some really dumb, off-the-wall, unbelievable stuff. I'll tell you one. Okay. So don't hate me, David, but it really happened. I don't even think he knows this story. When my son was like seven or eight months old, so here I am, pregnant with this baby. I go into his room one day to get him out of bed, and he is laughing his head off hysterically. I thought, what is this child doing that is so blooming funny? He had ripped off his pamper, taken everything in his diaper, smeared it all over the wall. He was hand painting behind his crib. <laughs> oh, lo and behold. I cannot tell you how bad it stunk in there for weeks. But anyway, he thought that was so much fun, right? He's just like painting the wall with this stuff. Oh, brother. See, this is the kind of stuff kids do. I 
promise you, you have no idea the things they do. Anyway, you know, if this was a react on your emotions, you'd be like, you know, beat the kid. Like, what in the world? And oh, my lands. And then you got to deal with this stuff like for weeks because it smelled horrible. Anyway. Okay. So you're right. This dog makes this big mess. My friend's dog recently had diarrhea. I said, I'd kill the dog or take it to the pound. Like all over the house. For real. Yeah. No kidding around. Because the dog was upset and getting away from her and just running. And it's just, okay. So anyway. <laughs> yeah. Exciting times. Human Humans have so much fun, don't we? But, you know, as a, as a, as a parent. Like your kid has it and it's running all down his legs and it's all over his clothes and it's everywhere he walked when he comes in to tell you about it. Yes, this has definitely happened before. You don't yell at this kid. You're not going to beat this kid. I mean, is this his fault? Not really. Jumping up. Why are you going to get on the kid? But if you let your emotions go wild, that's exactly what you're going to do. I won't tell you if that ever happened to me when I was a kid. But, you know, yell and scream at the kid like, hey. Hey, what's he supposed to be doing about this, right? He's mm -hmm. sick. It's going to just pour out of him. If we can learn to be kind to an animal and gracious to an animal whom you're right. I don't know what they're doing. They're, they're dumb. Their brain is like this big. What did you want out of them? A cat's brain is about this big. Hello. Yeah, for real. You got to get a hold of yourself. You are responsible for your own emotional state. If you are out of control, acting like a fool, beating on something or somebody and screaming and cussing, what in the world? Knock it off. They can't help it. That's not going to change anything. Oh, and sometimes that all comes pouring out of us because we are frustrated that we didn't do a better job of training this animal or this kid. Mm -hmm. Wow. Ding, ding, ding. Pay attention to that one right there. Because, yeah, sometimes our frustration with ourselves come pouring out of us toward the kid. That's not very fair. But it happens every single day. Literally. I saw that last week in Walmart. Obviously, this mom has this kid who's been out of control forever and ever. Mm -hmm. And this kid suddenly decides to act up in Walmart because it's always more fun to do it with an audience, right? Oh, of course. And this mom just starts smacking this kid and yelling and screaming and cussing at this kid. I'm literally going, uh, yeah. That's your own frustration with yourself from not training your child better. And you're just taking it all out on your kid right here in public. He's acting out in public. And so are you. Whoa. No kidding. I know whose kid this is. And that's a never ending cycle. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What do you think he's going to grow up for and do? Serious. <laughs> and so how do we change that? We go, okay, this is what I have fostered as a parent. This is what my kid knows, but this can change. Or you want to talk about determination and courage? Oh, honey. This takes massive amounts of determination and a lot of courage. Because this kid is not going to take to this change nicely. It's worked for three years. Why are you going to mess me up now? And I've gotten what I wanted out of it. Well, you know, pretty much. He thinks so. Trying to turn this one around, that's work. I mean, like six months to a year of work consistent work changing that around changing yourself changing what you're rewarding bad behavior with and going to more positive behavior and speaking with kindness and redirecting that child with a calm voice and a calm attitude oh yeah this takes time and strong effort but in the end when your child will stand up and say i really wanted that mom and you go, no, I already told you. We didn't come here to buy you that. We came here to get you shoes. And that's what we're going to buy today. And he says, okay. <laughs> wow. That was worth six months or a year's worth of hardship. Because now you have an entirely different dynamic with your child. Mm -hmm. And a positive one at that. That's going to work for the rest of his life. So don't look at me and go, oh, I know, but my kid's 10 and I can't fix it. Oh, don't tell me that because I'm not going to buy it. I already told you some things I didn't work with with my children till they were like seven or eight or nine or ten. I didn't know better. I was learning as I went along. And all of us had to be flexible enough to make changes and go another direction and fix problems. And we did it. And we made it. So whenever parents tell me, I can't, 
I would say, oh, you can, you won't. Because yes, you can. I know you can. I didn't say it was easy. But you can. Amen. Um, okay, so let's say you're in a marriage with someone who is not trying to practice healthy parenting like you are. How do you get around that? Oh, you don't get around it. Okay. <laughs> I think one of the most challenging things in the world is being married to someone or, you know, being a parental partner with someone who has an entirely different viewpoint of it than you do. Or I'll even say an entirely different style of it than you do. And somebody sooner or later is going to butt heads about this whole thing. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about a couple I know. And their children are now adults. So I'm even going to tell you the end result. Okay. The dad actually grew up in a home where discipline was practiced, not unkindly or horribly, you know, Occasional spanking, quite a good bit of time out or getting grounded kind of thing. The mom grew up in quite a lenient home. Really thought like just having a talking to was more than enough. And you never spank a child. And you grounding them is just cruel. You don't keep them ha from having fun. I'm dead serious, Alyssa. Just take my word about this. And so the mom who was a little stronger and pushier, she won out. Those children were never really disciplined. Okay. Now they're adults. One of those children did just fine, frankly. Like they kind of, uh, I guess they would, I would say in a sense, they almost self-disciplined. They were a reasonably strong person and they recognized sometimes they would do things wrong. And when they would do things wrong, they had a pretty decent conscience. And they would say, I shouldn't have done that. And I, I don't think I should be able to go to this party or I don't think I should be able to go to the mall. Like they really did kind of almost self-discipline. Their other child was pretty wild and knew how to manipulate the whole story and get away with stuff and whatever. All. Whoa, okay. And did a lot of stuff the parents don't even know about yet. <laughs> Just saying, you know, like, okay, could really do some things. Uh, the kind of like wild child, teenage, young adult years kind of thing. Um, and is now a parent and is a real lenient parent. Not surprisingly at all. I think again, that raising a child to be a man thought, you understand that? That I can't just raise a kid. I've got to raise a, a person that's going to be a mature, responsible young woman or a mature, responsible man, and what is that going to look like? Mm -hmm. So if you never discipline them, ay ay ay, they're probably going to have a really undisciplined life. That's not the greatest, right? So you have this parent that doesn't want to discipline. You have this parent who thinks they just need a good talking to, but you're not going to ground them, and you're never going to give them a spanking, and oh my goodness, so my first statement would be, long before you get married to a person, you better have some definite serious talks about what that's going to look like in your family. If and when we have kids, how do you discipline a kid? Don't interrupt him and go, I don't think that's right. I just let them really talk. If they go, I have no idea, that may not be true. They may not be willing to tell you or they really might not have any idea. But you better dig hard enough and long enough to know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. So don't go get engaged to somebody and then have this discussion. I think that's a bad plan. You know, now you don't have this discussion on the third date. But after you dated somebody for four to six months and you're pretty sure you see marriage somewhere in your future possibly, you better be having this discussion. And I hate to say this to you because it's tough to say, but I still mean it. If you have very directly opposed ideas about this, it may not be a good idea to get married. Because you know the three things people fight about and get divorced over? Money, kids, and sex. Uh, yeah, hello. This is one of the hugest areas. Like 40% of people who get divorced say it's about their kids. Okay, statistically, this isn't going to go well. You better really think this over. However, if you're already married, if you're already in a relationship, if you're already there, 
Okay, it's a little bit tougher now. You got to work this out. Usually somebody's going to win. Okay, that's a problem. And it's very difficult to have compromise. Like even healthy marriages don't always have a lot of compromise. It's very challenging to learn to actually have a compromise with somebody. Okay, so in building your skill set, one of the things that you want to learn how to do is to have a friend or a sibling or a parent who has very strong opinions about something that are different than yours. Learn how to have a discussion, maybe multiple discussions, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Not yell and scream and cuss and argue, but I mean discuss, discuss, discuss. Clearly explain your ideas and come to a compromise because you're going to need this skill when you get married. I want to promise you, you are really going to need this skill when you're somebody's mama or daddy. Man, are you going to need it. So you say, you know, I really don't think they need to go to that party. I really think they need to do their homework. I really think they need to be disciplined like this. And your co-parent says, I don't agree with you. Okay, great. Let's have a discussion till we can come to an agreement. I don't need you to be a dictator. I'm a really intelligent person with my own thoughts. And I don't want to dictate to you how it's going to look. So I want us to talk and come to an agreement. That's some kind of a compromise we can both live with. That's very healthy. You don't do this in front of your kids. Your kids don't need to hear all this. I would say this though, especially a kid who's 12 years old or older. The parents can actually sit with that child and say, you know, your mom said she would have liked to have seen this happen because of what you just did a day or so ago. You know, they stole their friend's bike or whatever. I believe this should happen. And your mom and I had a discussion about this. And this is the agreement that we came up with. And this is what's going to happen. Here's what's great about that. Now your child understands that people have differences of opinion and they have a discussion and they can actually come to a compromise and come to agreement about a, a certain action. That's really good for a kid to know. They didn't go through all the back and forth, but they understand that their mom and dad may not see things just the same. Oh, and they don't get to play both ends against the middle. So when the mom says, I think this should happen right in front of the kid, the dad's like, no, I know we need to do this right in front of the kid. The kid's going to choose which one he thinks sounds better. And honey, he's going to play that to the hilt. He's going to cause more trouble than ever because y'all don't agree. That's why you don't have that discussion in front of your kids. You have that discussion alone behind closed doors. Sometimes, I kid you not, when it's a really big one, I mean, it just happened and you're, you know you're going to do this. You look right at him and you say, you go to your room and we're going to go to ours. And I'll see you in 30 minutes. And you go in your room. And I mean, by goodness, you better have music or something you can turn on. So those kids aren't standing outside that door listening. And you have that discussion behind a closed door where your kids don't hear it. It's not their business. They're kids. If it really has to get done. But in general, wait till they're in bed. Have that discussion. Come to an agreement. Let the kid know both sides and the agreement that you came to. That is so healthy for a kid. So you don't have anybody to play against anybody else now. You already came to an agreement and this is what's going to happen. And you're both on the same page together. I didn't tell you this was an easy thing. I didn't tell you this is a skill that you're just going to cook up in the microwave, honey. It's going to take a couple of years before you develop this one together. But it's an awesome thing to develop. It's really good for your kids. Frankly, it's really good for your marriage. So it isn't hopeless if you have a really different parenting style. I will say this, though. If you have this really laissez-faire, oh, they can just do what they want. It's no big deal. And you know this is detrimental to a kid. You know it is. It's back to the pick your fight story. You know, you got to really know when to pick your fights. But this is actually a fight that's probably worth having to say. It really is not healthy for a child to grow up with no kind of discipline at all. You don't believe in corporal punishment? Mm, you know, I really strongly disagree with that. 
But if we're not actually going to spank them by goodness, then we are really going to grab a hold of their life and keep them disciplined so that they listen to us, they respond to us, and if they refuse to do that, there are going to be consequences. Because I know the long term where that's going to lead, and I'm so committed to this ideal of parenting, there does have to be discipline here. Like sometimes you've got to stand up for what you know. But if you're not in the relationship yet and you find out that person's parenting style is so far afield from how you see it and you have discussion after discussion and nothing changes, they're just adamant about that. I'd think long and hard, real hard, about getting into a permanent relationship with that person. Mm. Sorry. I know that's not good news maybe. I mean, for some of you people, I'm sure it's tough news, but I really mean that. You're just setting yourself up for a whole life, 20 years plus, of challenge and frustration. Wow. And probably hurting your kid in the long run. I think I agree with that. <laughs> okay. So that brings me to my next question. Um, actually, you brought up corporal punishment and how some, some believe in it, some don't. But, like, what about when two parents are in a foster situation? where corporal punishment is not allowed. How do you discipline an unruly child in that situation? I mean, obviously we know that there's a lot of issues behind that most of the time, but like in that sort of situation, just how do you deal with that and bring discipline into their life in a healthy way? Yeah, that is such a great question. Let me start off by telling you this. I've really dealt with numbers of people who have had foster children and quite a number of foster children uh, kids that were fostered getting into a position to be adopted and people who have adopted. So I've dealt with lots of that range of things. I've also dealt with a lot of kids who were abused. And so that's a big deal. Lots of foster kids have been abused. It's a pits. It's a huge part of why they get taken away from their own mom and dad. And I do mean severe physical abuse. Mm -hmm. You know, whether, uh, heaven forbid, but I'm going to tell it to you straight. Things like getting locked in a cage and not really feeding them or beating them mercilessly, breaking their bones, tossing them around, hitting them up against a wall. Just Lord help me, you don't even know the things some kids go through. There's a reason why within the foster system you cannot physically discipline a child. Many of them have already been through so much abuse, so much physical junk, trauma, unbelievable trauma, that you would just add to that. And so... It's really understandable why that's in place. I mean, really and truly it is. I, Absolutely. I can't even disagree with it. And I definitely would spank my children. I even spank my grandchildren. I believe in it. But, you know, I knew them from the day they were born. They knew me. They understood why. That was a whole different story than a foster child who's already been abused or been through physical things. They're not going to understand it. And I really appreciate why it can't happen. But I will tell you this, it really puts that foster parent sometimes into a tough place because some of those kids are wild and out of control and heaven forbid, what am I supposed to do with this kid right here, right? Okay. And so, A, you need to love that kid. And you know, to me, there are two parts to love, affection and discipline. They need to be just about dead equal, okay? Okay. And it's very challenging when you have this kid who's very out of control and very afraid and already been subjected to abuse to discipline him. And I'm not talking about corporal punishment, just to discipline him in any way, shape or form, because the whole world has been scary to him. Relationships have been damaging and, you know, crazy out of control to him. And you try to put these parameters of discipline into his world, he doesn't even know what to do with that. He's going to go ape. You know, he's liable to scream. He's liable to kick, bite, fight back physically. I mean, just anything because he just doesn't know what to do with that. Okay. I mean, a kid who's been raised by a couple of drug addicts, <laughs> come on, that kid is going to freak over discipline, over a disciplined schedule, over disciplined eating habits, over a disciplined bath time, over a disciplined bedtime, be real with yourself, honey. That is so foreign to him. And you're foreign to him. I mean, if you've even had this kid six months, 
You're still falling to him. He doesn't know you. And frankly, that child's probably not really thrilled to be with you. There is so much documentation about this. Even horribly abusive, unhealthy, messed up parents are better for a kid than strangers. They've established that. If somehow they can keep that kid with their own mom and dad, it's healthier for the kid than moving him into somebody else's house. That's why it's really a big deal when a kid goes into foster care. You have to know it's been really bad to move that child out of their own parents' home. And that kid is in trouble already. He doesn't know what in the world's going on. He misses his mom and dad. You all know that I have sons, so I do say he a lot. You have to forgive me. You know, misses mom and dad, misses what they knew as normal. That doesn't mean it was a healthy normal or even an okay normal. It doesn't mean they didn't need to get moved. I'm telling you where the kid sits. Wow. Okay. You took me away from my own mom and dad. You took me away from normal. Now you're trying to make me do all this stuff I don't really want to do. I've never done it before. I don't even know you, man. Who in the world are you? And you're going to tell me how it's going to be? You're going to tell me what I have to do? Ah, that kid's going to go crazy. Or totally withdraw. I mean, a couple of those things are going to happen or one of those things. They're not going to talk to you. They're not going to socialize with your family. They're not going to eat. They're just not going to anything. Okay. They don't want to be with you. They might go to school and be a little social butterfly and talk and, you know, have fun with their friends and come home and uh -uh. I'm not giving you nothing. I don't know you. I don't like you. I don't want to be here. Okay. So I have so much compassion for foster parents. Like, wow, you really care about somebody who isn't even your own kid. And you really want to give them a safe environment. And you want to protect them and nurture them and look after them. And they don't want you. And they're not going to be at their best because they've already been through trauma and difficulty and challenge. And they're a little kid. They don't even know how to process this. They don't know how to emote about this. And they definitely know, don't know how to talk to you about it. Okay, I really need to lay that baseline for you because I think a lot of times people misunderstand what it's like for the kid. Oh, this kid's just really difficult and this kid's really rebellious and this kid won't cooperate with me. Man, you better put yourself in that kid's little moccasins for a couple minutes. I mean, really put yourself there and go, yeah, man, if that were me, I'd act just as badly or worse for real. Okay. The other thing, the, the other option that's very frequent, let me not miss this one is they'll frequently act out. So you're talking like a kid between 8 and 12-ish who gets yanked out of their parents' home, and they're old enough to know that things were not really cool or not really what they should have been. So like in a way, they're kind of relieved to be out of there. Well, then they got all that guilt because they're relieved to be out of there. You know, they're going to really act out. And a lot of times they're going to act out what they saw. So if their mom or their dad were really sexually inappropriate, you might see that kind of behavior. If their mom and dad were drug addicts or alcoholics, you literally might see them try to get into your liquor cabinet or open a beer in your fridge. Or, you know, if their mom or their dad really did some stuff, you might see, see them going out and stealing stuff or destroying stuff. They might really act out. Okay. So they might just go ape wild emotionally. They might withdraw. They might act out in what look to be really inappropriate ways, but that actually makes sense to them. They're not consciously doing any of this stuff. It's just their reaction to what happened to them and what is happening to them now. So you really have to love that kid and go, you know, I don't even know what you've been through. Even if you think you do, even if the social worker told you, you don't know, you weren't there, you don't have a clue what that kid really went through. Mm -hmm. So you say to them, I don't even know what you went through and you don't need to tell me. It really isn't necessarily something I need to know. If you want to tell me, I really want to listen. But you don't have to tell me. It's okay. But I know it hurt you. I know sometimes you're sad. I really understand that you're angry. I get it that you feel very frustrated. I don't blame you. I'm sure I'd be frustrated too. You're in somebody's house you don't even really know. 
Maybe you've even been in someone else's house because lots of kids go from place to place. Maybe you've been in someone else's house and they hurt you. They were supposed to protect you and take care of you and they hurt you some more because Lord knows that that happens. But at my house, you are safe. I am going to protect you. I'm going to feed you good food. Maybe you won't like it all. Maybe it's not what you're used to. I'm going to feed you good food. I'm going to dress you in nice pretty clothes or really cute clothes or warm clothes, whatever matters to them. You know, I'll let you wear jeans and a t-shirt every day if that makes you happy. I'll go buy you a pair of boots, whatever. You know, I'm going to dress you. I'm going to give you a, a great bed to sleep in. You are going to be comfortable and warm and cared for. Every day that you are inside of my house, this is your home. I am going to take care of you as long as they let me have you. And maybe it'll be a very long time and maybe it won't. Maybe your mom and dad will get better. I don't know. I would pray that they would. But for this time, you are here with me. I am going to take care of you. I am going to protect you. I am going to give you a home. And I need you to act like this is your home. In my home, people contribute. You might have chores to do. Okay? I'm not picking on you. All of us do. In my home, you need to be clean. You're going to take a bath. Maybe you don't love it. Maybe you don't like it, but it's going to happen. In my home, you're going to put on clean clothes. If I need to buy you four or five pairs of jeans and four or five the exact same t-shirt because you like it, I don't have any trouble with that. But you can't wear the same jeans and the same t-shirt for two weeks. It can't happen. You've got to take a bath and change your clothes. I'll provide for that. In my home, we have a schedule. That means you're going to get up at a particular time. That means you will go to school. That means you will go to bed at a particular time. If you've had a life where you just got to do whatever you want, you could even go out and run around in the streets, and, and now you've got to be home at a particular time and eat dinner and take a bath and go to bed at a particular time, you might not like it. You might not like me for a while. That's okay. I like you. I'm glad you're here with me. And that's what we're going to be doing. That's what I expect from you. It doesn't mean we won't have trouble. It doesn't mean we won't argue. It doesn't mean sometimes you won't yell at me on a day when you feel angry. But in general, we're going to be kind to one another. That's what we do at my home. Love is kind. You just don't have to tell all that to him in all of those words. But depending upon their age, maybe you do. And then you just live it out. Do your best not to have a bunch of combat. They might try to make it a combat zone. If all they've lived, ever lived in before was a combat zone, they're going to make it a combat zone because that's normal. God knows if I can't be with my own mom and dad, at least I can have my own normal environment. Well, so don't go to the combat zone with them. You don't have to do that. You know, uh, a great time. And I've talked about this with your own kids, but I really want to talk about this with a foster kid is when they take a bath, and because of all the things that have happened to them, they might not want you to give them a bath. I can't blame them for that. If they're old enough to wash themselves, let them do it. Honest to goodness, if they need to take a bath in their underwear because of what other people have done, who cares? Let them take a bath in their underwear. It's not going to hurt anything. Big deal. Let them do it. But when you get ready to get them out of that bathtub, have someone in the household have a big fluffy towel in the dryer. Bring it into you. If that kid fights, this is the right time to deal with it. Pick them up out of that tub and wrap them up in that towel. Every bit of them. In nursing, this is called a papoose wrap. It's what we do to little kids when we have to do certain kind of treatments and we know they're going to fight. And probably in all that flailing hurt themselves. So we papoose wrap them. So you take that towel and you wrap them up. They don't have their arms. They can still kick you, but if you really wrap them good, that's even a challenge and you snuggle them. And they will because that towel feels so great and it's warm. They'll learn. They'll learn to relax. They'll actually, over time, it might take a couple months, you know, before they really trust you and figure out it's safe. You know, they'll learn to enjoy that time. Your own kids, they'll love it like forever, but, you know, a foster child, it may take a little while. And you just talk to them during that time. 
I'm really glad you're with me. I'm so glad I have the opportunity to take care of you. I'm glad right now you're a part of our family. I know sometimes you have hard times. You know, today I know you had a time, hard time with. Coming in to eat dinner, you wanted to stay outside and play with your friends. You know, you hit this boy at recess and the teacher was really upset and called me about that. And so you had trouble controlling your anger today. I understand that. Sometimes that's really hard. Sometimes I do too. You know, yesterday I yelled at, at my daughter. Remember that? I really yelled at her? Yeah, mom, I was so surprised. Right. Sometimes I have trouble too. It's okay. I understand that. You can't hit your friends. But I really understand what it's like, you know, to lose your temper. It's all right. But still, no matter what, even though you had a hard day, even though you didn't act very nice today, you wouldn't eat your vegetables, you threw your food on the floor. You, in spite of everything that happened today, I mean, acknowledge to them what they did. They probably need to hear it put into context that I recognized what you did. But you can also say to them, it's still, I'm glad you're here. And you know what? I still care about you. I'm still going to take care of you. I'm still going to love you. Even if you have a horrible, terrible, awful, bad day, I'm still going to be right here. So you give them that encouragement and you give that reassurance to them. When they do something right, I mean, if it's one thing, like they got up that morning and they put on their clothes and they didn't fight you. I mean, you're just all over that. Why well, was so, don't, no, just really call me. I was so proud of you today. I mean, I was completely impressed. Why? I had a terrible bad day. You know, I punched my friend and the teacher called you and I didn't eat my vegetables and I didn't come in when you called me. What? This morning I noticed you got right up and you got dressed. You were ready. That's the very last thing you want to tell them. They already know the bad stuff. I mean, you want to acknowledge that you know what they did. But you really want to acknowledge that you know what they did that was good and right. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon when you could tell them three or four things that they did that were right, and you really emphasize that to them. Well, huh, I, I guess something's different. They're not going to express that to you in words, but somewhere in their mind and spirit. Oh, I guess something's different. Like, I'm starting to catch on, or I can do something right. Or someone's noticing me doing something right and acknowledging it to me. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, there are ways to discipline them in giving them a disciplined life without corporal punishment. I will say this one thing. If they're really out of control, you know, they're pitching tantrums, they're breaking things, they're throwing things, they're going to do something that's going to hurt themselves. Again, sometimes they need to be physically restrained. I would still say one of the very safest things to do, especially if you're at home, is to use a towel. Wrap them up and hang on to them. Because that way you're not hurting them in your frustration. You're not even having the possibility of hurting them. Mm -hmm. um, you're not hurting them because a towel doesn't hurt, you know, and you can hang on to them and you have a better hold and they have far less opportunity to hurt you or to hurt themselves. So sometimes when you do actually physically have to get in there, do it in the safest way possible. It's really good to know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A lot of good advice there. there. Yeah. Thanks okay. for answering all our questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> you're welcome. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you guys a simple question, so don't freak out on me here. Okay. <laughs> you know, as young women, mm -hmm. when you look back and you look forward, okay, so you look at your life at your home and how things have been with your mom and dad, whether for good or for ill, you just look at that. And then you look forward and you look at your life. What do you think with your mom and dad made the biggest impact that's going to affect you going forward? You know, I told you it was quite the yeah. question. Yeah. yeah, that one would usually take a little bit of time to think about. But I guess, um, I mean, the selflessness probably. Just seeing how selfless both my mom and my dad were. 
uh, towards me and my four siblings, uh, you know, back when, in 2008, you know, when things were kind of tough and, you know, the economy went down. Like, when we needed to get stuff, like clothes or something like that, like, mom would, you know, get stuff for us. And, I mean, not even then, but now, like, or not now, but several years ago, back when she was still buying us clothes, she would always buy stuff for us, but she never bought anything for herself. Like, I cannot remember a time when my mom bought clothes for herself or just anything that was not necessary. Like, I never, I can't remember it. I've never seen it. And my dad, really, the same way. Like, he's always been so faithful you know he works in construction so he's it's hard work and it's long hours and it's very frustrating sometimes dealing with certain people and I never hear him complain about it he just does the work and he comes home and and he loves us and so that's something I really value is uh the hard work that I've always seen in them and the dedication and the selflessness and And how is that going to impact you well it's shown me that it's possible to do and that, and they've taught that to me. They taught those qualities and values to me. So it's not going to be as hard to show that to my children. Hopefully. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Okay. You see? Oh, with my situation. Uh, my yeah. Mom, your situation was significantly different. Yes. It was significantly different, but um, I mean, my mom went through a lot. Like, you don't have to give everybody details. It's really okay. I, I'm, I'm not going to give details, okay. but she went through a lot. Like, the, she did not have an easy life. And, I mean, I didn't have an easy life either. And there's a lot of things that I won't do that my parents did raising me. But she did always try. Like, she always tried to do what she thought was best. And, I mean, she didn't have a lot of good examples raising me or, like, for her growing up, she didn't have many good examples. Um, but I mean, she always really did try to do her best. And she could be surprisingly encouraging. She could be pretty discouraging too sometimes, but she could be surprisingly encouraging. And I mean, there's a lot that I'm, I'm not going to do when I have my own kids um, because of how she impacted me. But she also has impacted me enough to know that like when I have kids I want to be very encouraging to the way that she could be because I know how much it helped me and how much it affected me when she was encouraging okay and so yeah awesome that's probably what I'd say okay I hope you enjoyed this episode I think we covered some really interesting things (laughs) I thank you so much for that If you have questions or comments, please contact us at paintabeautifulpicture.com. Go to the website or send an email. We'd really love to hear from you. And thank you so much for joining us today. Really, I hope that you just get off of whatever you're on, Rumble or, you know, listening to an MP3 player and go hug and love your kid today. (laughs) Seriously, they're so awesome. Small humans are amazing, you know. I hope that you have a great day with your kid. Thanks for joining us. You may find additional information on our paintabeautifulpicture.com website. Additionally, you may watch me on Rumble, and you may also listen to a podcast on Buzzsprout or Spreaker, all under the name Paint a Beautiful Picture. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. You may subscribe, and if you are interested in receiving notifications, please hit the notifications button.